Buju, and welcome to the Red Lake Nation College Gikindasuin Podcast. Join us each week for discussion on topics including culture and language, career exploration, RLNC student spotlights, student projects, and other RLNC services. This week, we are continuing our student podcast projects relating to food sovereignty that were created in Dr. Wendy Greenberg's Spring 2022 Environmental Science class. This week, RLNC student Clay Byington interviews Awa Nukwe, Veronica Kingbird Bradford. Red Lake Nation College would like to thank the National Endowment for the Humanities for the generous support in the creation of this podcast. Miigwech. Bonjour. Uh, my name is Clay Byington. I'm a student at Red Lake Nation College. I'm in my sophomore year um, attending the Minneapolis campus. Um, today I'm doing a podcast exploring food sovereignty in our communities. And I have my guest here, Veronica. Um, Veronica, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, bonjour, everybody. Aunukwe in the go magazine do to Damonon, Miss Guagamiwi Zaga Ganing and Nonjaba Oga Kaning and uh um Miigwech for having me. Uh, my name is Awanukwe. I go by Awanukwe, but uh, my English name is Veronica and other people call me Veronica as well. Um my last name is Kingbird Bratfold. I am of the Eagle Clan. I am from Red Lake and I currently reside in Red Lake, so I'm happy to be joining you today. Thank you. Um, so, so, uh, what is your definition of food sovereignty? Um, I think, you know, that's, I mean, it's not always like a cut and dry answer for me. Um, food sovereignty to me is just so complex, but really the bottom line, um, for food so- sovereignty or explaining what food sovereignty is, is just to be food independent. Um, mm. There's just so much to um, think about when you're talking about food sovereignty. So when you say food sovereignty, you can be talking about um, Veronica. you can be talking about like the broader system of our food system in general. You can be talking about our indigenous foodways. Um, you can be talking about um, food reclamation, and um, you can be talking about protocols. There's so much that goes into it, and it's it's really fun exploring um, what food sovereignty actually is i think that it's a i think you, like you said it's 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 very broad it affects you know a, a large portion of our communities um, whether it's food sovereignty is from like food that we eat till we grow um all around i think that food sovereignty is uh, a thing that we should be aware of you know teaching the runs around us what age did you realize um, food sovereignty was becoming an issue in Indian country? Um, I guess I was never really, I never really um, identified the issue until I was an adult and started, you know, studying food sovereignty and food systems. Um, but when I started um, learning about food sovereignty, um, it was kind of like this journey I went on and I couldn't really pinpoint what was going on at the moment, I just knew that I felt good. Um, I was connecting with environment again. All of these amazing things were happening and coming forth and I was remembering different things again. But mm-hmm. yeah, like I said, it wasn't until I was an adult and started studying our food system and how it has impacted, um, you know, my life and my family's life. And actually at the time, um, I was exploring like, what is food sovereignty? What is going on with our mainstream food system? My grandfather was actually, um, he was actually battling cancer at the time and he was, he, you know, ultimately succumbed to cancer, but you know, it, it was, it really impacted me because I started to think about like all of my relatives who had passed on due to diabetes or, um, or cancer or, you know, just all of these things. And I started thinking about food, how it has impacted my life and, how that relationship with food um, wasn't always a good one with me. Um, so like, like I said, um, as an adult, I became aware of it. However, in hindsight, I think subconsciously there was something going on when I was like a child, like a little kid. Um, although I never was deprived of food, there was always this 
kind of part of me, I think that, and it's still, it's still in my life today. And I'm trying to break that habit is um, being like a concern of not having enough access to food, which is strange because I grew up in a household that, you know, I, I never had to go without, but now that I think about, you know, what happened to our ancestors and, you know, the great depression and like all these different things that happened to indigenous people um, and how maybe that trickled down to some kind of either sub- subconscious level or some kind of blood memory or trauma that I'm trying to, you know, think about. I don't know if that makes sense, but I, I know it's impacted me now that I'm thinking about my journey um, in my life and my relationship with food. I, I can see how it has impacted me because I have these things that I'm not clear about to this day, why I do certain things or why am I not healthy the way I should be? Or why don't I enjoy certain foods that I should? Or why do I enjoy foods that I shouldn't? You know, all these different mm. things that go into it. And I, I think that you make a good point. I think that food sovereignty a big issue um, especially when it comes to processed foods i think that um, i read an article that had said that when we think of pharmacy we should think of the farm f-a-r-m pharmacy uh, because we are what we eat versus uh, pharmaceuticals that just kind of cure us from the uh, the junk processed foods that we eat but um, with that being said what do you think that local government or tribal government could do to promote food sovereignty and reduce food insecurity in our communities? Well, I think, I think most people are aware that, you know, there, there is um, inequality as far as food goes. um, But I don't necessarily know, you know, if we evolve kind of went on that journey to realize how, how much our food, um, our relationship has, with food has changed. I, I think we know that, you know, yeah, we had commodities, we enjoy commodities, we enjoy fry bread, we enjoy these foods. We know that there's um, inequities where people don't have access to food at all times. We know that there's a disparity, but I'm, I'm not necessarily sure that, um, we've been given all the information um, on a widespread, I guess, platform to say, mm, what am I trying to say here? Um, um, I don't necessarily think that we all know the, I mean, we know the depth, to an extent, but I don't think all of us have really went and done a deep dive into um, like how much our food systems have been impacted, our indigenous food systems. Um, We don't necessarily know how much our palates have changed throughout each generation. Um, But I think that if we start acknowledging that and start, you know, sharing information with other people that I think that, I guess if we were to depend on government entities or anything like that, I think the best thing to do is um, probably start developing more and more programs that, Mm -hmm. that um, stress the importance of indigenous food ways. Um, and I think that's already being done for sure, but I don't know so much on a government level. We do have a SNAP ed programs that do that, um, but they also have curriculum and guidelines that you have to uh, um, stay in their box for too. So um, definitely, yeah. definitely sounds like there's a lot of, uh, of research that needs to be done more um, in our communities um, with food insecurity. We know well, yeah, I mean, before I started, before I started learning about food sovereignty, I never could really, I never really thought much of 
um, the food we have in our stores. I just thought it was normal. Um, if we wanted to grab a bite, bite to eat um, or even a quick snack or whatever, you know, up here would be going to, you know, a convenience store, getting a chuck wagon and a bag of chips and pop, you know, or pizza. Um, and that's what our palates become accustomed to. Um, but after, you know, starting to learn more about it and um, knowing about like what are food deserts, um, you know, why don't we have access to good food at a reasonable price? When I started thinking about that and learning about that, now I can see that there's a huge, um, we, we, we don't have access to some of those things. Um, and, you know, our prices are higher for certain items. And um, the lower priced items are the most unhealthiest option that we have. So when we opened up our new store here, I did my best to um, start purchasing the things that like I knew were offered in other places that I wanted to try to keep up here, like just my own preferences, but like dairy free milk because dairy is high. It gives high inflammation and there's a lot of, um, a lot of uh, hormones in there, um, a lot of antibiotics in there. So maybe like I would, I would buy in bulk, like the nut milks. Um, I'd buy in bulk, like anything I seen that was organic. Um, that didn't have pesticides or, you know, genetically modified. Uh, I would purchase a lot of vegetables and fruit or even like different kind of artisan breads that were hard to come by because I wanted to keep seeing them on the shelves in our community. Um, but unfortunately, they slowly started going away. And with this pandemic, I don't really know what the grocery stores look like at this time, but you know, um, it's just one of those things that I started to take notice of is, you know, what is being offered here. But also, you know, that's like a bigger, a bigger topic to start talking about anyways, because you can offer these things, but you, you really need to um, have people become aware to, you know, these different types of food to make them want to participate in these foods. And you, you have to offer opportunities for people to try different things and change their palate. So there's really good programs going on right now where they have cooking classes. So that's a good way that people can be exposed to different flavors and like different cooking techniques and all these different things. Um, me and one of my really good friends, um, he's actually a trained indigenous chef from Red Lake. So yay. Um, I've been learning a lot from him as far as cooking goes. We, we just like to have fun in the kitchen, but you know, you know, we, um, we often try to spend time in, um, in our community, like teaching each other, but other people about indigenous foods and how to eat healthier sometimes, not saying we eat healthy 100% of the time, but, you know, we do offer these different opportunities. And I know there's other people that are out there doing that as well. Um, but the more we expose people to healthier options, um, um, the more they'll try things. I think there, I think there's a thing out there where you have to like kids, they have to be shown something. I want to say it's something crazy, like 30 to 40 times before they'll even actually try, try it. Um, and I think that can go for adults too. Um, and then also with training your palate, um, you can absolutely train your palate to like different things. Um, but they do say you have to try something like a certain amount of time to actually know if you really don't like something. And so I've been training my palate um, by eliminating some of those processed um, inflammatory foods um, like flours and sugars and dairy. I've been trying to slowly eliminate those the past few years and incorporating really good foods into my diet, like things that I never really ate before, like the dairy-free options of things like, like fish and like, cause I never really enjoyed fish growing up. And if I did, it had to be deep fried, but trying fish in different, healthier ways. Um, I never really cared for venison because I thought it was too gamey, but now I'm really developing a palate and a preference for deer meat and bison. So it takes time for sure, but your body can adjust and you can start training your palate to like different things. Mm -hmm. I think those are all great points, especially with the palate. I feel like 
especially for us younger indigenous people, we were grown into this palette as babies. We don't, um, we don't know that the, uh, the originality or the, the originalness of, you know, an indigenous based palette, you know, I feel like our ancestors relayed on uh, <clears throat> meats local to our area, you know, wildlife and, you know, corn and beans and wild rice and potatoes, you know, um, before the French fries came along. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you know, and, and a lot of that is to no fault of our own that our palates became this way because we have to look at like, you know, when during the reservation era, when we all got put in these spaces that we couldn't, you know, migrate the way we did to sustain ourselves. Um, you know, just a lot of things were disrupted, you know, our whole life ways were disrupted. And so then they have the commodity era, era where, um, you know, we're relied on government rations, but then you go into what the government was doing at the same time was, um, and in the industrial revolution, bringing about all these different food ways to, to help women, like, like those um, microwavable meals or whatever, so they can work more, um, introducing different kind of breads, changing the way they made breads. Like before it used to be um, made with, um, you know, it had, um, it didn't have yeast in there. So there was probiotics in the bread. And so now every time they make bread, it's with yeast. And that really changes um, what you're putting into your body. And apparently um, it's, it's a lot worse for our bodies to have, um, you know, yeast with in our breads now. So just changing the way it is and then the way what things are offered in the grocery store, like we rarely see, you know, our types of foods, right? We don't see a whole lot of hazelnuts or bison or deer meat and, um, you know, we don't see fiddleheads. You don't see leeks and unless you're like at the whole foods now and you can, um, just there's seasonal things that community members sell. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's definitely no fault to our own that, you know, our food system was disrupted. And then coming back to like our generations, like our, our parents, you know, they grew up in a different era too, where, they enjoy different types of foods. And even I know my mom enjoys meat and potatoes and that's kind of the standard for this region. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and then when, we, when I was raised, um, I was, I was raised um, in the Bemidji area and there was a lot of fast foods coming out. So what is that McDonald's? That's always a treat Burger King, Pizza Hut, you know, all of those types of foods that we're exposed to. So then we have that, era where all these fast food companies are coming about so then our palates you know are developed in that way and and of course that's like I said no fault of our own what do you think that parents can do now um, in the home to help um, produce food insecurity and promote that healthy indigenous diet um, just promoting um, the indigenous diet, I would say um, bring items into your home that you maybe you don't enjoy, but you want your kids to enjoy. Um, start playing around with them, trying on them in different recipes. Um, just expose your children to them as much as you can, like make some apple like I what I make at home is some like apple fries and basically just cut up some fries and Mm -hmm. um, then I'll put a little bit of, uh, um, crushed walnuts on there and maybe some coconut whip or something like that. Um, or even yogurt, you know, um, but, but just by bringing more things into your home, I think that is really important. But, um, mm -hmm. the past few days I've seen something, um, that is very beautiful and it's, I think it's, it's been an ongoing, you know, tradition for long as I remember and I'm sure way before me but um I, I seen a lot of parents bringing their kids out to um harvest fish you know so they're out there with their their families harvesting fish but whenever you can get your kids out in the environment expose them to um developing a relationship with um where their food's coming from and 
who are these beings that are sacrificing themselves um, to sustain us, um, bringing back our, our, our continuing, I shouldn't say bringing back, but continuing to um, stress those protocols when we're, when we're out there harvesting our foods, like putting our sama down when we're harvesting any kind of plant being, um, harvesting when we're, I mean, putting out our sama when we're harvesting any kind of, um, you know, animal being too. Um, I think that really shows the children that there's a relationship that needs to continue to carry on with our, with our foods, um, with these beings. And, and, and also that goes back to having a relationship with all of creation to so all of those protocols. If we continue to do those, um, that's going to really set our children up for success. And I think that um, when you say uh, tobacco offerings, uh, when we you know harvest or whatever we're hunting to eat, I think that it's, it's good to recognize that we, we're putting tobacco on that and, and honoring um, the earth, you know, that we're all connected. And when we look at it that way, I think that our mindset changes um, versus, you know, in the capitalistic world we live in, um, can give you some compassion for the world, you know, to keep it, keep it in the, the steady cycle that it's in, you know, not disrupting, um, disrupting, you know, any other being that's living, you know. Yeah, you know, yeah, you know um, one of the things too, like I, um, like I really like to talk about is, so we know that our food system has been disrupted, right? We, we know that um, we've all been exposed to it, um, but there's kind of like a deeper level thing there. So I would say that's the, the top of the iceberg. But like mm-hmm. underneath there, some things that we don't necessarily see or critically think about all the time is what's happening below the surface. Okay, so our our food system has changed. What we eat has changed. But what's happening like on another level, something that is that we can't see, like on a spiritual level. And like I, I think about that connection that we have with our environment and like every being on the planet um, and all of creation, like how has that been disrupted as well? Um, Because our food system has been disrupted, right? So when we're talking about that and thinking about that, it's like, so there's these frequencies in our, there's these frequencies um, that we need to stay tied to in order to be well. So those protocols really can reach those frequencies, those prayers, those that asema, that the songs that we sing when we are harvesting, or um, the way we um, the way we do our protocols when we're harvesting deer. That that's reaching a different frequency that we need to stay balanced. And then um, and then I think about so because there's that disruption there, we've been disconnected in that way, um, really from like the, the animal kingdom, right? Because when we're harvest, when we're going to the grocery store and getting like um, a package of beef or something from a factory farm, um, we don't know, we're, we never participated in that relationship with that being that gave us life for us. We don't know what happened to that being, what kind of life that being led, what was going on to, to that being and that, that energy, what was happening to that energy of that being. So when, you know, when we're not taking part of that process, we're losing a part of, I, I feel like our part of our humanity in a way that's why like tonight before I came here, like I was out there harvesting, you know, Northern spearing Northerns. And I haven't done that since I was a little girl. That was the first time. Well, actually I take that back. I did that about 10 years ago. And I actually like, it's such a hilarious story. I was actually shot in the leg by with an arrow that time. I, I don't know. It's just a crazy story, but anyways, be careful with arrows. 
um, you know, I've been disconnected from harvesting fish in that way and having that relationship to that being. Like I didn't put out my SEMA for so many years to offer to that fish kingdom and those beings, like to give thanks, you know, to, for sustaining me. So by me going out there and getting back out there in relationship with that part that that entails taking a life from creation that um it it's it's doing something then anybody can think about in the physical realm um i guess i would say it's like on a spiritual level so so i I'm, I'm honoring those beings by actually partaking in that um in in that uh harvesting of that being and and saying thank you and doing things in a good way. And, um, and like right now, um, my husband is doing what he's supposed to do right after you harvest, you process this animal and you give thanks and, um, you don't waste. So Mm -hmm. just being a part of that, that, um, that, that part that we should all be partaking in. Um, that's one of the biggest things I feel like we can do to, you know, get our connection back um, to our food ways and actually um, to ourselves. Um, closing off here, um, I, and I do appreciate all the comments and dialogue we've had tonight. Um, what is your favorite Indigenous dish? Ooh, that's a tough one. My favorite Indigenous dish. Ay, ay. That's really difficult one because like I enjoy so many, but um my favorite what would be my favorite. There's so many favorites. Like I'm thinking about the smell of sap when it's boiling, like even tasting some warm sap that's not quite syrup yet. That's amazing. I'm thinking about, you know, the the way that leeks taste right when you harvest and you add them to your food. I'm thinking about, you know, um, I'm thinking about the wild turkey that I just had for lunch that my nephew harvested for us. And I'm thinking about those things. So I don't know how I narrowed down to like the favorite because there's so many, but um, I'm just, I'm just thinking it's hard because I'm thinking about like now the garden and like, how do I forget? But um want to say who's my favorite um who's my favorite i don't know i might have to say wild plums okay yeah wild plums just because they're sentimental to me (laughs) but they're it's all great (laughs) i like to my my favorite is uh choke cherry jam after oh yeah after yeah. it's canned and stuff i know so great there's so many good options out there i really love it um um this summer um we me and one of my really good friends we we often would go into the woods and harvest together and it's just her and i but we we thought maybe this summer we'll just open it up and just say hey if anybody wants to come and learn from us and harvest with us then join us and so we're going to have a couple sessions throughout the summer as, as we start, um, as plants start growing. And so tonight was our first one. We went out together harvesting those northerns and we're both going to be making um, bone broth out of northern. So um, very good for you. So I'm very excited about that. I've never had it, but I'm going to try it. <laughs> nice. Well, I miigwech for joining me tonight. Um, do you have any words of wisdom as we end the call? Um, no, I think I, I, I just want to say for everybody to just keep trying. Um, don't give up. Um, so do as much as you can, when you can. It, it's not going to happen overnight, but it's totally worth it. Good words. Thanks, Veronica. And thanks, everybody, for listening. Which? <laughs> <laughs>
We hope you enjoyed this week's episode. Be sure to join us next week as we hear from another RLNC student and their food sovereignty interview conducted in Dr. Wendy Greenberg's Spring 2022 Environmental Science class. Achimi Gwich to the following for their efforts in the creation of this Red Lake Nation College Gikin Dasuin podcast episode. Opening and closing music by Director of Equity, Cultural Education, and Archives, Floyd Buck Jordan. Opening introduction, closing preview, and production by Innovation Center Coordinator Brandon Spears. Our host this episode, RLNC student Clay Byington. Our guest speaker this episode, Assistant Professor of Indigenous Sustainability Studies at Bemidji State University, Awa Nukwe, Veronica Kingbird Bradfold. And the National Endowment for the Humanities for their generous support. Be and have a good day. <laughs>